begin reading at verse 29. Luke 19 and 29. Luke 19, verse 29 down to 34. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh, speaking of Jesus, to Bethage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in which at your entering ye shall find a colt, hide whereon ye yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him thither. Bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do ye lose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that went, and they that were sent, went their way, and found him even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. During 1950s, probably 1940s, there were their slogans throughout the United States, Uncle Sam wants you. Uncle Sam wants you. In an effort to gain recruits, for the war campaign. With the help of the Holy Ghost this morning, I'd like to preach on this thought. The master has need of him. Or the master has need of you. Let us bow our heads one more time this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you for how you are in our midst this morning. Now I pray, Lord, just anoint my mind and my lips to bring forth your words. And anoint our minds and our hearts to receive your word with gladness. For we ask these things in no other name, but the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Master has need of you. When we look at this passage here, just to do a little bit of background, Jesus Christ is about ready to go into Jerusalem. We call it the triumphal entry. And I realize in the time span, we're a few weeks before that, but this is the passage we're reading from. Jesus is sending his disciples, two of them, to get a colt, to prepare for his entry there in Jerusalem. They go, and where are they going? We find that he's close to Bethage, and he's close to Bethany. And notice that he gave them direct orders, very specific. If anyone asks you, why are you taking this cult? Tell them, the master has need of him. Notice that Jesus Christ did not tell them, tell them that Jesus said he needs need of them. But he very specifically said, the master. When he says the master, that means whoever is at that place will recognize that Jesus Christ is the master teacher. He is rabbi or rabboni. So there will be no hesitation. That person to which they speak is a follower of Jesus Christ. When we look at where they were, they were very close to Bethany. Scripture does not tell us where exactly they got the cult from. But considering the location Considering the fact that the master has need of them, some commentators believe that the cold itself or the donkey belonged to Lazarus. So when they said that the master has need of them, notice that there's no struggle, there's no fight, that's my donkey, you're not taking them. But matter of the fact, at the mere mention that the master has need of him, the cold is released into the disciples' care. This morning, you realize that God wants you. The very first thing I want to look at is the master chooses what he uses. Notice that Jesus Christ sent them for a colt. He sent them for a donkey. 
He didn't send them for a pig. He didn't send them for a cow. Or if we want to go with the way that the mindset of the Jews should have been at the time through studying scripture, how should Jesus Christ have ridden in through Jerusalem? Or the white stallion that we see him in Revelation 19. Because that's really how they perceived him on his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He was going to triumph over the Romans. All their suppressors were going to be trampled on that day. But notice that Jesus did not choose the white stallion. He did not choose an animal that was ridden before, but rather he chose the donkey. Why did he choose the donkey? Well, when we look at a donkey, a donkey is a work animal. And when Jesus was walking, going through Jerusalem, he was sending a message to him that day. I've not come to deliver you in the way that you think I've come. Because once again, going through that mindset, Jesus Christ should be in the white stallion. But rather, he came on a donkey. Because the donkey is the beast of burden. And we want to look at it, even in today's mindset, would you rather ride a donkey or a horse? Probably everybody's going to select a horse. But a donkey is one of the lower animals, especially when you compare it to a white stallion or even black beauty. They don't go riding in the Kentucky 500 on a donkey. They go on horses. But why would he choose a donkey? Because Christ didn't come at that time to deliver everyone from their oppressors. Rome was not about to be overthrown by the kingdom of heaven. Christ had not come yet to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. But rather in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Rejoicing greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Christ had not come yet to deliver them from their physical oppressors. He was making a statement that he has come as the suffering servant of Isaiah. To be beaten and broken simply because Adam messed up in the garden. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Could he have overthrown Jerusalem at that time and overthrown the Roman Empire and the kingdoms of the world? Yes, it was a matter of calling down his angel. But it was not yet time. So he chose the donkey. It is important for us to remember this morning. God chose you. You get that this morning? God chose you. He did not choose the President of the United States. He did not um, choose the 12th Imam or whoever's residing right now, the top Muslim leader. He did not choose the Pope. He did not choose the Rothschilds, the Carnegies. God chose you. John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. If you have a red letter edition of the King of the Bible this morning, notice it's not me. Jesus said himself, You have not chosen me, but Jesus said himself, I have chosen you. And not only chosen you, but ordained you. Giving you power to overcome. 
giving you power to go out and work in my fields and my vineyards. Power to go out and talk to those that need salvation for me. Power to go out and deal with those that are sick and broken hearted. See, people will celebrate you when you are doing what is in their best self-interest or what they think is in their interest at that time. You will become popular if you're doing what, they're do to, what they want you to do. We talked about that already this morning at Sunday School. You know, the blab it and grab it theology. You know, it sounds great to go out and lay your hands on a Porsche or Ferrari, assuming you know how to drive stick, because I don't know if they're automatic yet. Brother Andy can probably tell you more of that. But that doesn't mean God's going to give it to you. But there's other people out there that will tell you, you pray for it, God will give it to you. I heard one lady tell somebody um, on TV before, say, you send me this much money, and God will give you the entrepreneurial spirit. I know there's lots of spirits out there, but I have never heard of the entrepreneurial spirit before. I know there's many I don't know, but my gut tells me the entrepreneurial spirit does not really exist. People will celebrate you when it's in their interest at that time. But notice the moment that you're no longer doing what they want, they'll turn on you. They'll stab you in the back. They'll talk against you. But they will turn on you when God is doing something that is not popular among them. They did it in the life of Jesus Christ. As long as he was doing what they wanted at that time, he was popular among them. But to those that Jesus was, uh, that did not like what Christ was doing, they were constantly talking about against his back, trying to trick him. At least one point in their life, they, his life, they at least tried to push him off a cliff and kill him. People will turn on you the moment that it is not in their best interest. Even if God is working through you and talking through you. Why do you think people hated the prophets so much? It was all great when Balaam was talking prophecy, but you get an Elijah in there, or an Ezekiel, or an Isaiah, or a Zechariah that starts talking doom and gloom, even though it's the word of God, and they're going to turn on you. The true gospel message is not a popular gospel. Because people don't want to hear the whole thing. This world is full of people that will make religion fit their interest. But when the man or woman of God stands up and declares what God wants, they are committing a hate crime. But yet, let us not forget that we did not choose God. He chose us. And for such a time as this, we are here. We may not be popular. We may, may not be packed to the brim. But God has chosen us for this time to deliver his message. God does not use the proud but he uses the humble. God often uses those that the world would overlook. I oftentimes go back and I think about Billy Graham. How many of us in here have heard of Billy Graham before? All of us have heard of Billy Graham. But what we don't know is that for years, years, Billy Graham's father, who was a businessman, and other businessmen of that area would gather <laughs> together on the Graham farm and pray that God would raise up somebody in their community and send them into the world for the cause of Christ. But did Billy Graham's father really expect that it would be 
so many times we pray for things, but we never realize who it might be. The same thing is very similar when it comes to John uh, praying high, a man who's known for prayer. His father prayed that God would rise up an intercessor. But did he, and he was a minister, but did he ever think that that intercessor would come through his own son? When we look at the life of Jesus Christ, how many miracles did Christ do? Lots. Volumes cannot contain them. But if we would take a book of all the miracles that Christ did in Jerusalem and compare it to the book of miracles done in Nazareth, which book would be greater? It's not the book of Nazareth because that's where he was from. And he tried and he did miracles. But when we get into the word of God, he didn't get to do the miracles he wanted to to the extent because of their unbelief. If we go back and we recash the account, I don't have it in my notes, but we'll come to those that knew Jesus Christ growing up. Is this not Mary's boy? Don't we know his brothers and his sisters? And then we get the verse. A prophet is without honor, save in his own country. See, God will use those that the world will overlook. There are probably some in people's minds back home where I'm from that I they might still be trying to grasp about how is um, Justin somewhere else? His family never moved. For a decade, I told people that we would be moving because I knew that was God's will. We wouldn't always be here. Didn't always know. But a prophet is without honor, save in his own country. God will use those that the world will overlook. When we get into the disciples, what does Acts chapter 4 verse 13 tell us? After we have the man there sitting at the gate, beautiful, Peter and John comes along, silver and gold have I none. Man gets up, he's leaping and walking in the temple, worshiping God. And then there comes those people. You know, the one that the world looked at and said, that doesn't fit what we want it to fit. What they're preaching and doing, we don't want anything to do with that. Then we have to get them to stop somehow. Those kinds of people. Acts 4.13 and when they saw the, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, Peter and John were not somebody that you would think would get up and deliver a gospel sermon. In fact, Acts chapter 2 probably flabbergasted some people that might have been there in the crowd that day. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, recognized that they were unlearned and ignorant men. But you know what? They didn't choose God. God chose them. And because of it, the Bible says, they marveled. They marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You see, the gospel message is not going to fit this world's theology. It's not going to line up. But God will use those that the world overlooks. God will use those that the world doesn't deem worthy. God will use those that are made learned and ignorant. Why? Because it just points all the glory back to him. Because then they just have to marvel and say, you know what? They've been with Jesus. That is the only answer. You realize this morning that God has chosen you? And maybe you would say this morning, well, Pastor Justin, I'm like those disciples. I feel like I'm unlearned. I feel like I'm ignorant. I feel like I shouldn't even be doing anything. Well, who am I to go and try to tell something, someone about Jesus? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
25 to 27. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You realize this morning, God chose you for a reason. God chose you for a reason. And it's not something to take lightly. Why hasn't God called Einstein to come and deliver the gospel message? Why hasn't God called, I don't know, Zig Ziglar to come to our church and give the gospel message this morning? or some other great orator, or someone more prominent, or somebody wealthy, maybe one of the descendants of the Carnegies, or uh, the Rothschilds, or the Vanderbilts. Why did he choose me? Because the proud cannot serve God as long as they are proud. He chooses the lowly and the humble to do his work. Because he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Because when someone who is unlearned or uneducated like John and Peter gets up there, there's no reason for someone to jump and be healed miraculously in the temple. These people had nothing special about them. They were unlearned. They were ignorant. But God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And the last thing I want to look at is not only did God choose you, but the Master is waiting for you. Not only has God chosen you, but He is waiting for you. Because you see, we are God's hands extended. World. Matthew 9 38 states, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Matthew 10 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, a wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Mark 6 7, And he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Luke 10 and verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the, Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Once again, God has chosen you and is waiting for you. Luke 10 and verse 3. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. We know that God could send forth his angels to deliver the gospel message. He's going to do it at the end of the tribulation period. He sent forth his angels to deliver the gospel message to the shepherds that morning. The Savior is born. But the truth of the matter remains. God's chosen us to be his hands extended. When he says about praying that he would send forth labors, he's not saying pray that he sends his angels down. He's praying that one of us would pick up the mantle and go into the highways and byways and compel them, convince them to come in. Like the Apostle Paul when he's there standing before uh, when he's standing on trial he's told thou almost 
almost, almost persuades me. You realize there was a point when Paul was being kept prisoner that they had to change out the guards. And they started with one time frame. And they started changing them sooner and sooner and sooner until finally they were being switched out every six hours because he was starting to get them saved. We have to keep these people out. If, if that man keeps talking, if Paul keeps talking, he's going to gain another one for his God. We can't do that. we got to keep them serving Aphrodite. we got to keep them serving Apollos. Got to keep switching them out, brother us. Make it quick. Make it quick. Because that apostle starts talking. That man who doesn't have much in appearance, that man who isn't great, a great order, he knows the Torah. I'll give him that. But there's nothing special about him other than that. God has chosen us, and he is waiting for us. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge. Notice he didn't say angel. He said, I sought for a man that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found not. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. As Sister Beth comes to the piano, the question this morning is, will you allow God to use you? Will you allow God to use you? He's chosen you, but he's waiting for you. He's chosen you, but he's waiting for you to decide that I'll go out into the highways and byways and tell them to go in. I will be the one to stand in the gap. If no one is willing to do it, I'll do it. For me, that question gets a little bit more personal because when we were in Bible school freshman year, we had a move of the Holy Ghost right there in the classroom. And when we had left, Brother Predick had written on the board, I have called you. I have called many others. But they have not come. Will you do the work of two? This morning, the question to you all is simply this. Will you allow God to use you? Mark 16, 17, and 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He gave us the gift of the Spirit. He's given us so much. But what are we doing with these things? He has chosen you, and He is waiting for you to say, Here am I. Send me. Whatsoever you ask of me, I'll do. Wheresoever you will send me, I will go. Whoever you bring in my path, I'm willing to speak to. If you bring a sick in my path, I'm willing to lay hands on the sick with faith, knowing that they will recover. If your answer this morning is, Lord, send me. Lord, send me. Then why don't we find ourselves a place?